Before I get into the substance of our presentation, I wanted to talk about something completely unrelated today. If we had been able to meet in New Orleans on Tuesday, the 7th of April, you would have seen me walking around the uh, hotel and the conference with this shirt on. And I want to talk a little bit about Green Shirt Day and what it is. Those of you that follow the international or sporting news may remember the story of the Humboldt Broncos from a couple of years ago. They were a junior hockey team in the Canadian province of Saskatchewan who on April 6th, 2018, as they were traveling on their team bus, collided with a transport truck at a dangerous intersection. As you might imagine, this news reverberated across the sporting world as well as across Canada, particularly when you factor in that 16 members of the team as well as a number of team officials would perish in that particular accident. The response was felt at the local level as well as throughout the professional hockey community, even throughout communities across Canada as folks took to trying to find a way to express the grief that many of us felt from this particular incident. As you might imagine, Canada being a large country with hockey as its national sport, there was a great deal of participation in youth hockey, and with that participation often comes many hours on a bus to travel from one event to the next. I know myself, I've probably spent hundreds of hours sitting on a bus going from one game to the next or on our way back home. So this impacted us as a nation quite significantly. As we tried to come to grips with this tragedy, one of the things that often happens, both as part of the grieving process and as a part of the media just being the media, is we started to look for some good news stories that came out of this. And there were many to be certain for some of the players that had only been injured. Every bit of recovery was a bit of good national news each evening. But one of the more significant ones was what has become known as the Logan Boulay effect. And if you haven't Googled this before, I would encourage you to do so. Logan Boulay was one of the 16 players that died as a part of that crash. And on April 7th, 2018, his parents made the difficult decision to donate his organs to those who needed them. This decision was made a little easier for them because during the summer that preceded this tragedy, Logan himself sat down with his father and had the conversation about the fact that he wanted to follow the example that one of his own coaches who had recently passed away had done. And he wanted to, whenever it was his time, to donate his organs to those who needed them. Now, as you might imagine, as this story started to gain traction, the Canadian Transplant Society, along with almost every provincial, territorial, and federal government in Canada, proclaimed April 7th to be Green Shirt Day, a day in which we would encourage all Canadians, and I would say all individuals everywhere, to not just register to become an organ donor, but to inform your family and friends of those wishes. One of the things that most people don't realize is that even if you have indicated on your driver's license or some other document that you are an organ donor, that your family still has the ability to say no to that particular request. So be sure to tell those individuals that are important to you that would be those who may be contacted following this kind of tragic event to let them know what your wishes are. Anyway, back to the actual presentation. So this is a presentation that actually follows up on some work that I and Karen had done with a group of colleagues a couple of years ago. So starting in, I believe it was the fall of 2017 and continuing into the spring of 2018 
Um, Karen led a team of students under the direction of Rick West and myself at Brigham Young University to essentially do a analysis of the various journal articles that we could find related to K-12 online learning. And as you can see from the abstract, we took all of the articles we could find, which was about, I think it was 350 something, 356 is in my mind, and see what we could discern about them in terms of applying the same methodologies that Rick and his students had applied in the past as a part of a journal article review series that they had completed for the magazine Educational Technology. So we were essentially using that methodology, but instead of looking at a specific journal, we were looking at all of the journal articles in a given field. And I won't go through all of the stuff that that article found because obviously you can go and read that article yourself and it's not the focus of this particular article. One aspect of it, though, was something that caught our attention. So as we looked at all of those 350-odd articles that we had identified, um, one of the things that we found was that some of them were quite highly cited. And you can see here the top 20 in terms of citations. What caught our attention even more wasn't so much this end of the scale, but the other end of the scale. So according to the authors of the work that was published in 2019 that had been collected in um, 2017 and then analyzed in late 17, early 18, they had identified 23 potential articles that they felt hadn't been cited at all, and 91 that had received five or fewer citations. So what we wanted to do was instead of looking at essentially what we could learn from all of the journal articles published during this 23-year period, we were more specifically interested in what could we discover based upon those low-cited and unsighted articles. Um, so we essentially look to apply the same methodology that had been used in the journal analysis series, but to reserve them just to those articles that were unsighted or those articles that had five or fewer citations, which we described as low cited articles. Uh, so the first step, obviously, was taking a look and seeing that um, based upon our review of the data that um, was provided in the open access system the, from that original distance education article, we were able to identify 10 articles of the 23 that still remained unsighted and only 52 of the possible 91 that had five or fewer citations. Now, some of this could be due to the fact of essentially inaccuracies in the original data. More likely, I suspect that it's due to the fact that the analysis for the original article was conducted in late 17 and early 2018, whereas our analysis was taking place in 2019. So there was essentially another 12 to 18 months of publications where many of these articles were likely cited multiple uh, times, which would have either gotten them off of the unsighted list or moved them from the low cited list to those that had six or more citations. So that's probably why the numbers differ. But regardless, we were looking at 62 articles that uh, comprised of this particular study. So looking at some of the journal analysis metrics that we were using, one of the interesting things was these articles that we found that were either unsighted or low cited, it's not like they were written by folks that people had never heard of. In fact, if you look at this table here, one of the things that you'll note is many of the names that you see either on the unsighted side, which is over on the right hand or the left hand side, or the low cited side, which are those on the right hand side, are the same names that you would have seen in the original article that was published in Distance Ed as those people that were top authors in terms of the 
um, number of authorships that they had or the number of articles that they had contributed to as part of the complete data set. Names like Michael Barber and Ken Stevens and Kathy Kavanaugh and Dennis Beck and Nikki Davis and Diana Greer and Glenn Russell and Elizabeth Murphy are all names that you would have found on the table in the original distance education article as being some of the most prolific authors in the field. So many of these articles, in fact most of these articles, were actually uh, were authored or co-authored by folks that were well known in the field. Similarly, if you look at the journals that they were published in, um, when you consider the various articles that were here, um, the journals you see You've got the number of unsighted articles in there, and then the number of low sighted articles in there, and then you've got the total there, and then you've got the total number of articles that were in the original data set, and then you've got the rank that that journal possessed in the original data set. And as you can see, the journal that has the most unsighted and low sighted articles was also the journal that had the most articles in the overall journal set. Similarly, the journals that had the second, third, and fourth most articles in our data set for the low and unsighted articles were the third, fourth, fifth, and seventh journals in terms of the larger data set. So when you go down and look at the list here, you'll see that most of the journals that are represented here, with the exception of those right at the bottom that only had a a single article in each of them when you get down to the six journals and 26 journals that's those that only had a single article in each that were in the tied for second last or last place in the overall matrix that we were using uh, in the complete data set so it's again in the same way that it's not like these articles were being written by people that we didn't know and that's why they were unsighted or hadn't been cited that much in the same way they're being published in journals that folks in the field are quite familiar with and have found other articles that tend to be more highly cited from so that's not the reason why these particular articles aren't being cited that much so that came to uh, so that led us to actually looking at what these articles were specifically about. And maybe that's one of the reasons why they didn't receive any citations or only had received a low number of citations. So looking first at the 10 unsighted articles, one of the things that uh, we noticed right away is that the 10 unsighted ones, for the most part, tended to be in some of the more obscure outlets that we found, so ones that would have been on the bottom of that previous table. And in most cases, they, in addition to being in a more obscure outlet, they were also an outlet that wasn't open access. So they, um, unless you specifically knew about it or saw it cited somewhere else, and because it was unsighted, it was unlikely that you saw it cited somewhere else, um, you wouldn't even know to go looking for these things to be able to go find them. Another thing that we noticed was that the majority of these, in fact, the, the um, it was just over a majority, I think it was six or seven of the ten articles, were focused on context outside of the United States, whereas the vast majority of work that has been done in the field, or at least that's been published in the field, has been published inside of there, about stuff inside of the U.S. And in most cases, they tended to um, not include any original data collection, um, but focus up on describing teaching strategies that um, they wanted practitioners to be aware of and from a research standpoint, things that might be useful for a researcher to know about that might lead to additional um, systematic studies, but not things that wouldn't have been available in other sources as well. Looking at the ones that were low cited, we see a couple of similar things. Um, one is that most of the 52 low cited ones, in fact the vast majority of them, were case studies and the case study was generally focused upon either a single program context or um, either of those things at a very specific 
point in time. So in terms of the generalizability of the findings, they tended to be limited uh, for those reasons. Additionally, many of those case studies focused upon non-U.S. settings were published in international journals or written by folks that would be defined as international scholars. And by that, we meant folks that weren't located at U.S.-based institutions. Um, many of these case studies were also focused upon rural contexts as well, which may have also limited their applicability to uh, a wider body of research. In terms of some of the um, other themes that we found in terms of the content, a lot of it looked at the benefits or potential for K-12 online or blended learning or the perceived challenges of those. In most cases, those articles tended not to be based upon actual data, but the authors or the stakeholders' perceptions of what those benefits, challenges, um, or potential could be. And in many cases, they tended to overemphasize the benefits or the potential and underemphasize the potential challenges that existed. Looking at other topics that were in those 52 low cited articles, as you might expect, there were a lot of media comparison studies that were comparing student performance in the online environment uh, against the face to face setting. Um, but interestingly, there were a number of articles that looked at either online teaching, online course design, policy issues related to K 12 online learning and the use of online learning with populations who had special needs. And it's the last one there that I think is most interesting because that's a topic that's relatively new within the field, which may explain one of the reasons why some of those articles were low cited. The other three in the middle there are all topics that you would think would be of interest to those who are exploring in the field. And it would be a real interesting analysis to actually do some sort of citation analysis for articles that were written on topics related to teaching online courses, designing online courses, or online learning policy to see what the authors of articles in those areas cited compared to these particular ones that were obviously in many instances unsighted because they fell into that low citation column. Looking at, I guess, our overall impressions, um, one of the first things to state is that many of these articles, particularly the low cited ones, basically four out of every ten articles that we looked at, have been published in the last five years or so. Um, which means that one of the reasons they may have no citations or very low citations uh, is because of the newness of them and the fact that they just haven't been around long enough yet. Uh, secondly, again, many of them were written in less known journals or journals that were difficult for folks to access, although most of those authors were folks that were fairly well known in the field. So it isn't like the scholars in the field wouldn't have had the ability to get access to some of these articles if they were known to them from those well-known authors. Uh, finally, the topics that we found ranged all over the place, but for the most part, they tended to have a narrower focus, oftentimes case studies upon individual programs or on very specific jurisdictions, which may have made them difficult to generalize to larger contexts, which might explain one of the reasons why they were unsighted or that they didn't have that many citations. So the article is actually going to be coming out in the next month or so in the online learning journal, which is published by the Online Learning Consortium.